A little bit of background. Um, there were two historians in Cumberland County that were really the trolley experts, Chick Siebert and Dick Steinmetz. And both of them did some minor work on the trolley to Mount Holly and also the trolley that went to Newville, but not in the detail that they did in their Valley Railways book. And a couple of years ago, as I was researching something else, which is often the case, I came across a picture of a trolley in Newville, and the tracks were in a different place than what Vic Steinmetz had said they would be at. And that kind of intrigued me to study more about the trolley to Newville, and that tied in the trolley to Mount Holly. And as I did so, I came to learn a great deal, and I eventually did two books, one on the, the, the Mount Holly trolley and one on the Newville trolley. So we're here today to talk about the trolley to Holly, and it's a pretty, to me, fascinating story. Feel free, if you have any questions or comments, to make those as we, we go through. But a little bit of background. The first trolleys came to Cumberland County about 1896, and there were two companies. They first started to build from Harrisburg to the West Shore. That was a separate company. And then they started to build a trolley from Carlisle. It was originally to go to Mechanicsburg. And eventually, those companies were consolidated into what became Valley Railways, which was a big trolley system in the county that ran from Harrisburg to Carlisle. And it also went to New Cumberland. It went up to West Fairview and Enola and up to Marysville. We're all probably a little bit more familiar with that than we are with the, the, the new bill in the Mount Holly trolleys. Now, as the trolley was being built from Carlisle to Mechanicsburg, it went from Carlisle to Boiling Springs to Churchtown to Mechanicsburg. Kind of a roundabout way, and that's, that's kind of a neat tour to take too. And as they did that, the, the people that were in charge of that started to develop plans to build a trolley from Boiling Springs to Mount Holly. Now their trolley line would have been in Boiling Springs and it would have been a short jump to Mount Holly. But they decided not to do that and that's where the star of our show comes in, an individual by the name of Patricio Russ. Probably his real name was Patricio Russo, but he shortened it to Russ and he was known in many cases in the newspaper as Patrick Russ. Russ is a pretty interesting gentleman. I haven't been able to find a picture of him. But he was born, his parents were from Italy, and they were immigrating to the United States. He was born on the boat as his parents immigrated to the United States. He ends up in Harrisburg working as a boot black in a hotel, polishing shoes. In the process of doing that, he meets some people, senators, businessmen, and until he's done, he ends up to be an extremely successful businessman. He builds the, the Mount Holly trolley, which we'll talk about. He builds what becomes Riverton Water Company, which is now the, the water company, Pennsylvania American, I think it is on the West Shore. He owns a number of hotels, and he ends up building a, a very fancy house in Harrisburg up by Italian Lake. So here's, that's the guy. He decides, instead of, when the Cumberland Valley Traction Company decides not to build from Boiling Springs to Mount Holly, Mr. Russ decides to build a trolley from Carlisle to Mount Holly Springs. And in July of 1900, he organizes the Carlisle and Mount Holly Railway Company. Now, the, the Valley Traction trolley, and I'll keep this kind of short, came into Carlisle on Pomfret Street. And it then turned on Hanover Street and came to the square. They also built a line to Ridge Street, so that the, the Valley Railways trolley ran to the intersection of South Hanover and Ridge Streets. Russ builds his trolley line from, initially, South Hanover and Ridge Streets south to Mount Holly. Okay? And he's in partnership with um, the Cumberland Valley Railways, which own the other railroad. And he partners up with B.F. Myers. He was a businessman from Harrisburg. He was elected, I believe, as a senator, a number of other Harrisburg businessmen, including a number of capitalists from Steelton, which isn't a town today that we would picture as a, a capitalist hotbed, uh, but there were a lot of very powerful businessmen in Steelton. They organize the Carlisle Mount Holly Railway, and they go about constructing it. Starts in the summer of 1900, and they build along the Holly Pike. Now, they didn't build on the Holly Pike, because at that point, that was a toll road. 
and a privately owned highway, but they built beside it. We'll, we'll take a picture at a little bit of that in a minute. And the first cars arrive in, in April of 1901, and the cars start to run in May of 1901. And they initially start to run from the square south to Mount Holly. When they get to where the subway is today, that, that trolley track stopped. You had to get off the trolley, walk across the tracks, and get another trolley, and then that took you the rest of the way into Mount Holly. <laughs> Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, in terms of the right-of-way, it starts in Carlisle, as I say, at the end of Hanover Street, and it proceeds along the Mount Holly Pike. It was on the west side of the Holly Pike. So if we're going out the Holly Pike, the trolley right-of-way was on the left side until we get to Pine Road. <coughs> and at Pine Road, the trolley right-of-way then went to the east side of the highway. And that got them on the right side for the, the car barn. And then it went right down Baltimore Street in Mount Holly and ends up at the park. This is a, a 1914 map. Now when they built the trolley line, the only passing siding on the trolley was at Midway. It was actually called Rudy's Woods and it later became called Midway. That was the only passing track so that a car would leave Carlisle, it would stop at that passing siding the car from New or Mount Holly would come in and stop there, and then they could pass. Not very efficient. They later built a passing siding in the area of Bridge Street and went out by the car barn that we'll, we'll talk about. Now, in terms of locating the right-of-way today, there's not much that you can see of it. If you're going toward Mount Holly, on the left-hand side, there's the, um, the Beetle Streets, Lennon and Sebastian Streets, um, the little housing development. There's a farmhouse sits along the highway and there's a cast iron fence and you can see a very little bit of the right of it on the left side of the Holly Pike. And you can still see the bridge piers when you get down to the crossing of the creek. We'll, we'll take a look at some pictures of that. But that's where the trolley ran. Here's what it looked like. Here's the trolley right away on the right hand side. Here's the Holly Pike. This is looking north. Um, I think this barn is still here. So this would be... Um, about what the 14, 1500 watt maybe met of the Holly Pike. And you can see it's it's pretty primitive. The nice thing about trolleys is they can go up and down hills pretty good, where trains weren't as good at going up and down grade. And the trolleys could be built relatively inexpensively. So that's what it looked like. Now the intent in building this was what? To get a return on their investment. Okay, they, they figured they'd spend the money to build the trolley line, they'd get a return on their investment. Do you think we would make any money doing that today? <laughs> but they did back then, and there were less people then. Now, you have to keep in mind that when they started this in 1900, there were no automobiles in Cumberland County. 1903, there were five automobiles in Cumberland County. <laughs> 1905, we had 35 automobiles in Cumberland County. By 1915, Henry Ford was building a million Model Ts a, day, or a year. What killed the trolley? Okay. They didn't know that. So they were kind of venture capitalists. So we come into Mount Holly, and these postcards a lot. This is looking north from uh, about where the used supermarket used to be on Baltimore Avenue. This stone wall is still existent. Um, this is the curve, and then right up here would be where the Deer Lodge was, or is, or might be again. <laughs> um, don't tell Terry I said that. Um, Terry Rickard plays a story in the development of this book and this program, so um, I have to thank him for his help, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But to give you an idea, that's what the trolley right away looked like. One of the two people that they killed with the trolley died here. There was a, a deaf woman walking. She got run over by the trolley, and, and she died. Um, quite a controversy. The other was a, a fisherman, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to the powerhouse. Remind me if I, I forget to do that. And then it ended at the park. Now, one of the interesting things to me as I work on this is, how many of us have seen postcards of the, the trolley park at Mount Holly? Okay. And most of us, if, if we've not seen those, or if we have seen those, we probably have no idea what the park looked like, right? And that was one of the questions that intrigued me, is what did the park look like? And I'll explain that as we go. But what we're looking at now is the end of the trolley line. This is a dance hall, the dance pavilion. 
this is a milk race, and I'll, I'll show you some maps of this, and I hope it will, will make more sense as we go. And we did a, a walking tour of the park recently, and we'll probably do those again or on the bus trip. We'll, we'll get out and we'll, we'll look at the ground in a little greater detail. But the, the holly pike is off to the left of this picture. There's the holly pike, then there's the mill race, then there's the trolley. The parking area for the deer lodge here would be on the right, and the deer lodge would be more towards you from this point. So that's what the trolley right of way looked like. Not very exciting, not very dramatic, um, but that's, that's what it looked like. They built a car barn at Mount Holly to help orient you. Watt Street is the last street on the right as you went to Mount Holly before the subway. And it's kind of an open parking lot now. The, the car barn, which was here, burned down in the 1940s. But they had the car barn and their trolleys are described in a little greater detail in the book, but numbers one and two look like this. They were Jackson and Sharp cars made in Wilmington, Delaware. And cars three and four were also Jackson and Sharp cars. They were open cars, also built in Wilmington, Delaware. And at one time, they get to as many as 11 trolleys. So this is their car barn. Now, the Valley Railways had a separate car barn in Carlisle. That's down where the Carlisle Glass is. The building that survives is the tower plane. The car barn was next to it. Um, this later also became the car barn for the trolleys that ran the Newville. And I'll touch on that. And we'll also do a program on the, the Newville trolley separately. They built a power plant in Mount Holly that was water operated. The sheets is now in this area. Yeah. Okay. And the power plant was back along the creek. There's nothing there that can be located anymore. It's, it's all changed uh, from back in this time. Now, their other fatality, they generated power here and supplied the trolley from Carlisle to Mount Holly. They also, in 1910, supplied power to the Newville Trolley Company. And they had a 30,000 volt, 33,000 volt power line went across country from Mount Holly up to, if you're familiar with the West Pensboro Township building on the Newville Road. That was the powerhouse that converted the power from 33,000 volts down to the 600 volts DC that went to the trolley. Well, there was a fisherman in the area and he had a metal fishing pole. And as he cast, he hit the 33,000 volt power line and was electrocuted. So that was the second person, and the, the, the second person that they, they killed. Now, the, the power plant, um, like I say, there's, there's no trace of that. But initially, it was water powered. Later, they put a steam power plant in. And then eventually, in the early 1900s, they started to supply power to Mount Holly. So Mount Holly got electric in the early 1900s. Carlisle got electric in 1888, just to show you how ahead of the curve we were. Now, the subway at Mount Holly, as I said, wasn't built until 1905. So when you, you went by trolley, you had to stop. They stopped the trolley, you got out, went across the railroad tracks, and then got in another car and went to the end. And it was a big deal in the valley when they put the subway in, because in 1904 they connected the trolley from Harrisburg to Carlisle. There was a gap in Mechanicsburg. <coughs> if you're familiar with where the uh, Keystone Model Railroad Club is or the powerhouse transformer building used to be outside of Mechanicsburg, they wouldn't let the trolley go across to Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg. So it was the same deal. You got the trolley car in Carlisle Road, there got out, got another trolley, and then went to Harrisburg. 1904, they made it continuous to Carlisle. And in 1905, you could go from Harrisburg the whole way to Mount Holly without getting off the, the trolley. You change cars in Carlisle, but um, that was quite a controversy. The trolley tried to build a cross, and the railroad tore it out, and they spent a couple of years in court and fighting each other, and then eventually the, the, the railroad paid to, to put the subway in, and the trolley company contributed. But their powerhouse, we're looking toward Carlisle, the car barn was up here, that's Watt Street, and, and the subway. Their first trolley cars, they get two trolley cars, um, very creative, they number them one and two initially. <laughs> um, they had big plans. Later they renumbered into the 30 series, similar to Valley Railways, but initially they're numbers one and two. These were interurban cars. They were yeah. relatively big cars. One had rattan seats or the, the woven like cane seats. The other had plush railroad style seats. And they made a big deal out of that. And these things would go 40 miles an hour, which was, Pretty impressive to everybody. <laughs> Five cent fare. And one of the, the things that, that they relied on to an extent were obviously the commuters that came from Mount Holly and work in Carlisle. 
there wasn't too much industry, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple minutes, but there wasn't that much industry in Mount Holly. <coughs> but they opened the park in the early 1900s to encourage people to go to the park, and they had to pay a trolley fare to get to and from the park, five cents each way. And that's why the park was built. And that's really what paid for the trolley was the, the, the park, the amusement park at the end of the line. But this was pretty nice stuff. And Russ was a promoter. He became involved in the Holly Inn, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But every, every year, he would get all the newspaper reporters from the Cumberland Valley together, from Harrisburg and Carlisle and Chambersburg. And they would charter and they'd go out to the park, and then they'd go to have a big dinner at the, the Holly Inn. And then for a week or so afterwards, there'd be big articles in the newspaper about the Holly Trolley and the Holly Park and how neat it was. He was a pretty smart guy. And um, so he promoted it. So I said some of their other cars, this is number five, it's a later car, is an open car. And they also had what we called trailers that looked very much like this, but they had no motors. So they could pull two cars with one operator. It's a little bit cheaper. You can see that they had couplers here. Um, Imagine how much fun it'd be to be able to ride that today, huh? And if, if you've ever been up to Orbizonia to ride the, the trolleys there, it's all open. Yeah, they're all open, and this would be a pretty big deal. Now, keep in mind that in the early 1900s, Carlisle didn't have sewers, and it got pretty warm, and like in the summertime, imagine how nice it'd be to hop on that car and breeze out the Holly Pike at 30 miles an hour, no air conditioning, and then go into the Holly Gap and be able to spend a day at the park. And that's that's really what they they traded on was that ability. They had bands, they had performances, they had a lot of specials at the park. It was a, a pretty exciting thing. Now Patricio Russ owns the trolley. He's the principal stockholder from the start until 1907. 1907, there's a financial panic. Russ is in a little financial trouble and he's building the Riverton Water Company. So he sells the majority of his interest to some Chambers Park business people and bankers, Tom T.M. Nelson. and there doesn't appear, at about the same time, the Cumberland Valley Railway starts to take over the trolley line, the, the Valley Traction Line, the, the, the Cumberland Valley Railways. But there's no connection between Nelson and the Cumberland Valley. I almost think that they were competitors, although I can't clearly establish that. Russ was a promoter, and I think when Nelson and his friends bought the trolley line, they realized that it wasn't making as much money as Russ told them it was making. Just saying. And for the next three years, the trolley line goes into a little period of what I would call benign neglect. It's, they don't fund it. it, it doesn't make any money, they don't maintain the park, and there's a turnover of personnel, and it has some negative impact. Then in 1910, the story gets interesting. And if, if you came just to hear about trolleys, I'll apologize now, because we're going to get into some politics and intrigue and some mystery and all sorts of what I think are neat things. In 1910, there's an organization formed called the Cumberland Railway Company. Initially, it's formed to build a trolley from Middlesex, which was then known as Balfour, to Carlisle. That's certainly going to be a prosperous business adventure, right? I mean, think about it, from, from Middlesex to Carlisle. Well, that project morphs into a trolley line from Carlisle to Newville. This is in 1910. And the backers of the Cumberland Railway Company are listed here, and I'll go through them. John Graham, who's heard of John Graham? Where's John Graham from? Yeah. Newville. Wealthy man. Where did John Graham get wealthy? John Graham made millions of dollars in the trolley and traction in urban business across the United States. He had many trolley lines all over the United States, including in the Midwest, the West, also Wilkes-Barre, Hazleton area, and, and he was quite wealthy. I think Mr. Graham was a reputable person. Although, as we'll see, he gets affiliated with some people that aren't so reputable. J. Kirk Bossler. Bossler was a well-to-do member of the community. The Bosslers were very wealthy. I don't know that J. Kirk had as much as J. Herman, but the Bosslers were very wealthy. J. Kirk Bossler was from Carlisle's Upper Crust. He owned and operated the Bedford Shoe Company. Walter Stewart was the treasurer of the Farmers Trust Company. Well educated, successful, pretty interesting individual. I think he too was reputable, as was Bossler. 
But they decided to get hooked up with some people that were, well, you can make your own decisions at the end. This next person is the most intriguing person in the program to me, William F. Pasco. And I'm sorry I can't locate a picture of William F. Pasco. But Pasco was from the Allentown area. He was a civil engineer. He became the leading engineer of bridges for the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Now, the Lehigh Valley Railroad was extremely successful. And to be their lead bridge engineer, he had to be a quite good engineer. He was very successful there. He left there. He became the chief bridge engineer at the Philadelphia Reading Railroad. Again, he had to be a pretty sharp civil engineer to do that. Not long after, he goes into the business of traveling around the Northeast United States building trolley lines. Kind of a promoter and uh, an interesting guy. He ends up, in 1906, involved in a company called the Dayton Heater Company, which made heaters for trolleys in Dayton, Ohio. His first wife had died, and he marries a well-to-do woman from Dayton, Ohio, and ends up in Carlisle running the Dayton Heater Company, and he, he gets into the upper crust of Carlisle society. He was uh, politically active, Republican. He was involved in Teddy Roosevelt's campaign a little later on. All the people of power and wealth in Carlisle came to like this guy. When you look at the social pages, he's out there with everybody. And his wife's daughter, which would be his stepdaughter, marries into the Bossler fortune. So, I mean, this guy's connected. They buy the Carlisle Opera House, which set right where we are now, before it burned, it was known as the Strand. But anyway, long story short, Pasco is a, a successful trolley promoter. The last trolley that he promotes before he, he comes to Carlisle was in Shemokin, and he gets tied in with a guy by the name of J.A. Ring. J.A. Ring was a bottler in Carlisle. He ran the Carlisle Bottling Works from 1906 to 1912. He bought them from John S. Lau. And he was involved in a number of other things. And he was tied into what I would call the Shemokin Mafia. I don't know that that's an accurate term, but there were some judges and politicians and other people that invested in trolley lines. Eh, kind of interesting group. And, and Pasco was, was tied into those guys. So that helped get him to Carlisle and his trolley thing. Long story short, Pasco and his wife have a falling out. They become estranged. She ends up owning the Carlisle Opera House, and he comes back here in December 1915 and commits suicide in the Opera House. Okay. That's Pasco. The next guy is Samuel Kitzmiller. Now, Kitzmiller, is in, how many of you plan to come to the Newville program? Okay, we well should because I'll really go into detail on Kitzmiller then. But Samuel Kitzmiller was a bond salesman from Shippensburg. His wife was Melissa Kitzmiller, who owned the Kitzmiller Apartments. She was known as being rather eccentric. Well, she and Samuel were probably good company. <laughs> Samuel uh, was less than good for Mount Holly and the trolleys, but anyway. And then the other person in Cumberland Railways Company, I know I'm talking about the Mount Holly trolley, but Cumberland Railways Company, William H. McCray, who was an attorney from Newville. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through the rest of the story, but just keep in mind that there's a cast of characters here that this little trolley line that Patrick Russ built and then sold to the people from Chambersburg is now sold in 1910 to these people from the Cumberland Railway Company. And things start to get really interesting from here. Now what happens is, they bring in a lot of fresh capital, in part through selling stock and bonds for the Cumberland Railway Company. And as a result of that capital, they upgrade the Mount Holly trolley, they upgrade the park, and they go into the glory years of the Mount Holly trolley from 1911 to 1913. And then from 1913, it degenerates, it declines into bankruptcy. The, the Holly trolley is sold in 1920 to a, an individual by the name of McDonald from Carlisle, who also owned the Carlisle Foundry. But if you ever seen the little Carlisle mailboxes, they were made by the Carlisle Foundry, not a federal equipment company. And McDonald ran that to the 1940s, and he operated the Mount Holly trolley from 1920 to 1930. So that's kind of what happens to the trolley. And the other part of the, the story is the park. So everybody's okay on the corporate history? <laughs> okay. Well, just let me, I'll, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here. In 1911, 1912, the, the, the trolley at Mount Holly, the park at Mount Holly, 
and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but the area where it was located was located on the property of the Mount Holly Paper Company. And the Mount Holly Paper Company goes bankrupt in 1912, and because the park was on the paper company property, Samuel Kitzmiller buys the paper mill so they don't lose the trolley park and his trolley line goes bankrupt. Now, the paper company was not operating when he bought it. But they had a couple people working there to maintain the boilers, and a lot of the houses around there, including those in the Holly Gap, were owned by the paper mill, and the people who worked at the mill rented their houses from the paper mill. So Kitzmiller goes to the Mount Holly Council and says, if you exonerate me from all taxes, I'll reopen the paper mill. The Borough Council says, we can't do that. Samuel says, okay. He closes the paper mill, banks the fires, closes it, and doubles the rent for all the people that live in the company houses. There's two dams involved. There's a dam in Upper Holly, a dam in Lower Holly. He doesn't maintain those. Both of those eventually fail and flood the town. Kitzmiller's not one of my heroes. But that's part of this, this story when we, we get into the, the, the Kitzmiller saga. So the Holly Park is really the, the reason of the existence, or the, the trolley line survives because of the Holly Park. So talked a little bit about the Holly Gap. The Holly Gap became a resort in 1870. The railroad was built from Carlisle to Pine Grove Furnace. And at that point in time, it became possible for people from out of the area to come by train to Carlisle and then take the train to Mount Holly and stay in Mount Holly. The Holly Gap had a lot of attraction to people as a resort beginning in the 1870s. What became known as the Holly Inn, or was known as the Holly Inn, was developed in 1882 by the Mullins and other people from, from Mount Holly. They put running water in it. We can still find a water tank way up on the hill behind the paper mill. They had running water into the, the Holly Inn in the mid-1880s. It was quite an attraction. And they would lease that for each season. The, the guy that really promoted the Holly area as a resort was this John Mills. He was from Washington, D.C. He rented the Holly Inn in 1886 and 87. He publicized it. He was a noted chef, and that really put Mount Holly on the map as a resort. He got arrested and went to jail for selling alcohol to minors, and that was the end of him. But <laughs> his promotion paid off. So this is an 1880s woodcut of the park at Mount Holly. This is the existing trolley line. This is Route 34. This is the race that went to the paper mill. This race came down, the road went over it, and then there was a bridge across the creek that took water into the paper mill, and the park is developed in this area. So we're looking at, this area is now the parking lot for the, the Deer Lodge. Is everybody okay with the orientation here? And they start to develop a park. Now the park is a pretty dynamic place, but just to give you an idea, the Deer Lodge would be right to the upper right-hand corner, and then the park developed. Now, initially, and by the way, Rachel Zuck, who's the curator here, drew this map based on survey data that Terry Ricker and his company did for us. He actually gave us the survey. You ever see those guys with poles and the GPS surveying things? We spent a day at the park, identifying where the buildings were and mapping them out, and he donated all that time and labor and effort and, and helped us do this. But the initial park ran pretty much from here out. This is the dance pavilion, I'll go through this a little bit more, a restaurant, then there was a public restaurant, cooking area, another dining area for a while, there was a, a bridge with a bandstand, um, bowling alley, and then there was a recreational field and a cottage up in this area, I'll go through this in a little greater detail. There was a playground and a picnic area, and there were lithia springs and iron springs. They were fraudulent, but they promoted them as that. It's just good old Mount Holly mountain water, but they called them lithia springs and iron springs. Um, nowadays, you, you not get away with that, but help orient you. This is Route 34, the creek bridge at the time, and then Route 34 going in. This is the dam, you can still see the remains of that. Then the mill race that went over to the paper mill. The initial park included a bowling alley, two lanes uh, for a bowling alley. Later, they built a roller coaster at Mount Holly. That was 1911 to 1913. And toward the very end, then they had a merry-go-round as well. So the park was kind of a, a dynamic place. It changed with time. But that gives us a little bit of a, an overview, and then we'll, we'll take a little closer look. 
They put out a brochure to promote the trolley. This was about 1904. And we can see at this time that Russ was still the general manager. The superintendent was an individual by the name of Constantine Fowler. If you've heard of um, John Fowler, the attorney, or George Fowler, who's currently the attorney, that was their predecessor. He works here until 1906 or 1907 and then becomes a contractor with Carlisle and was very much involved in the start of the Chamber of Commerce and a lot of other business activities in Carlisle. The Fowler family in Carlisle goes back to the 1800s, the Civil War. I mean, fascinating story there, too. But they developed a park and they took pictures and they promoted things. Now, there was a lake at the upper end that dam was breached a couple years ago and they had a launch. Now, they didn't take pictures of their launch because it was little. So they used the factory pictures of the launch, and you'd think they had this big boat up there? Well, they didn't, but remember, Pat Russ was a promoter, so pretty interesting. This is the main walk, and this is now the road that goes back to the uh, parking area for the preserve. This is an area up toward the lake called Lover's Lane, and probably tell stories about that, but it becomes pretty well documented through postcards as early as 1904, when this, this photograph was, was copyright, it was mailed in 1906. This is standing about where the dam is, looking toward the south so that the road that goes back to the preserve is off to the right. You can see the bridge was here from about till 1907. There was a flood that marched the bridge and the band stand out. They never put it back. The toll gate, the toll house building is off to the left. That's about where the Snoopy tree is now in the Holly Gap. And then the railroad and, and Route 34 are off to the left. Interesting thing about the postcards is prior to 1907, you couldn't write on the address side of the postcard. That's why on all these old postcards you see writing on the front. And then 1907 they changed and you could write on the back, um, which was pretty good. 1906, the trolley company takes a series of pictures and they turn them into postcards. And this is what they called the um, central Mount Holly Park. This is about where the uh, spring is now. We'll take a, a little bit more look at that in a minute. But they took these kind of neat postcards and promoted the park. The first good map we have is 1906. Here again is Route 34 and the Creek Bridge, the dam we can still see. This was a little gazebo. You can still see the stone retaining wall here. This is the dance hall. Lithia Springs is down there. This is the public restaurant. So again, we've seen the picture in the upper right. This is looking to the south. Here's the dam, here's the toll gate. I know it's a little hard to see. The park's off to the right. This picture looks south so that we're looking down the race this way from this angle, so the dam would be behind us. It's, it's kind of primitive. These are rather early postcards, and we can see some of the improvements that have been made to the park. Of course, they had electric lights there, which were, were pretty exciting. This is the north park. This is the, just about this picture, about where the, the Deer Lodge is or was, you look and see there's a building on the left, that was the bowling alley. Now the bowling alley was across the, the raceway and across the highway from the main park, and it was never that successful because it was too far away. Now you had to pay, I think it was five cents a game to bowl as well. So that wasn't free. But you went out here, the main attraction was really um, the park itself, the Lithia Springs, the spring is still out there. This is in the area where Weiss's Emico or Arco was, and the spring's out there. Don't drink the water, it's polluted. Um, but the Lithia Springs is out there, and again, that's what it would have looked like early on and later they cleared it. Now, when they took these pictures, they were careful. The Lithia Springs is maybe 40 feet from the dance hall. But the way they take the pictures, you don't see the other buildings, so it always looks open. It makes it look larger. And I think that's pretty interesting the way they did that. Of course, they, they colorized these pictures. Here's the dance hall. Again, the raceway is to the left of the hedge. This is a little bit later picture. The trolley ends in the dance hall. They had bands there. And especially the Wednesday half holiday, the afternoon tradition of being off around here on Wednesday afternoon. They had bands there on Wednesdays. They had them there on Saturdays. And on Sundays, you couldn't have a band, but you could have holy music, religious music. So they had religious theme bands on, on Sundays. The admission to the dance hall in the park was free, and over time, they enlarged the pavilion. So if you look at some of the pictures, you'll see it, it gets bigger with time. 
The rest of the park stretches off to the south. Interesting thing with the benches, there were several hundred benches. A friend of mine, Mount Holly, has I think half of them now. Um, Bob Murray, who helped a lot with this project. Um, they're apparently quite collectible because they apparently give up. There's one on eBay now for $300 if you'd like to have one. <laughs> Such a deal. Um, so they are collectible. Not mine. Not mine. <laughs> uh, they, they do exist. There's a couple dozen of them I think they were accounting for. Of course, every time the creek flooded, and that was pretty frequent, all these things would wash into Mount Holly and they'd have to go get them and carry them back up. <laughs> uh, so we're lucky that we, we have any. Then there was a public restaurant, and they served ice cream. And this is an actual picture. You can see how close it is to the, the dance pavilion. Most of the photographs, when they take it, they take it away from the pavilion so you can't see that and see how close it was. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's interesting. Over time, you can compare some of the cards and some of the trees. Um, you start to really study this or obsess about it. Um, and again, all this, we've located it. This is looking south, the restaurant, then the main park walkway extends to the south. Of course, the creek's over to your left, and Route 34 is off to the left. When you get out here and look at the topography, you can still see some of these features are, are pretty, pretty unique and pretty interesting. They had a public kitchen. This was a big charcoal grill. There were four cooking areas, and they used Mount Holly brick. The brick plant in Mount Holly operated from uh, the early 1900s into about 1912 or so when it went bankrupt. So of course they used Mount Holly clay uh, or Mount Holly bricks. Then this was the public dining area. They also had hot water there so you could make coffee or tea and that was free. And so you could cook your own food if you didn't buy it in a public restaurant eat here. And the bridge that went across the creek was right here. And then the walkway continues to the south. We're looking here north now with the public dining area on the left. But you can see how they, they fixed it up with time. They widened the paths and put stone walls in. And then they put lights in and lantern lights and made it quite attractive. It would have been a, a, a pretty neat place, I'm sure, um, in the summertime. The walk along the lake, as, as we've talked about. And of course, it is always a couple degrees cooler there, and it's usually breezy, so it would have been pretty nice to, to escape there. The toll house on the left, about where the Snoopy tree is, and we can see the bridge across the, the lake that they made when, with the dam. And, the dam is, is right here in the foreground. And then you get a little further south. Yeah, they actually they planted hundreds of trees over time, too, that have since grown up. Now we get into the, about the parking area now for the preserve. And these were listed as Lithia and Iron Springs. There was a playground area for the younger group in that area. You can walk back in there now, it's pretty overgrown. And there was also picnic grounds in the area. And here you can see the, the path where it splits. That's the current road. Over here is Route 34. So it's, it's not very big and it's not very remote, but there wasn't the traffic on the highway at that point in time. And it was, it was pretty distant. Um, then up toward, the, as we continued south, there was an athletic field and then what they called the cottage. Now, the athletic field is still there. It's private property. And this house still exists. It's now a two-story building. Again, it's private property. And they don't take kindly to people going on the property up there. They're nice once you talk to them and you get to know them. But don't go up there and walk on their property. If you do, don't use my name because I've um, <laughs> come to know them. There's a little bit more to that story. But um, so these, these properties still exist. A lot of baseball games, and there were a lot of newspaper articles over the years of rivalries between newspaper games. On some days, they would have as many as maybe three to 5,000 people ride the trolley to the park. Pretty big turnout. And a lot of community groups, businesses, churches would have their picnics there. So it, it became quite busy and for a while was, was quite profitable. And then you continue south, you walk up to what the lake was, and there was a boathouse up there. You could go boating and had rowboats, and there's, there's a lot of pictures of that. Um, there's, there's the lake and the boathouse. Now, this has been drained, and it's filled in. You can still, I think it's part of the preserve, you can walk into here from, from Route 34, and you can still see evidence of, of some of these trails, and there's, of course, a lot of hiking. 
uh, up there now. So this was the, the Holly Park, and as I say, the, the reason that that existed was to obviously get people to ride there, and that's the launch edge that they used. That's the actual boat probably that they had, <laughs> just to show you how Russ is kind of a promoter. Um, by 1916, there's two features show up in the Sanborn map. One is what's left of the roller coaster building, and then at that point in time, the merry-go-round. So here we see Route 34, the Deer Lodge would be in the upper left-hand corner. You can see that long skinny building on the right is the Walling Alley, then the merry-go-round, and the, the roller coaster. Now the roller coaster was Pasco's, part of Pasco's rebuilding of the line, part of his invention. Here's the pictures we have of the roller coaster. This is a, a copy out of the either Volunteer or the Herald. This is the building. The photograph in 1917, about 100 years ago, shows what's left of the building. When they tore the roller coaster down, they left the head house of the roller coaster there, and people used it for picnics. This is toward the end of the trolley line. And these people had actually come by motor coach or bus uh, or truck and, and had their own picnic there and took some photographs and they ended up with Bob Murray. So that's all we really know about the roller coaster. If you go out Route 34 now, if you're headed to the Deer Lodge parking area, there's some logs laying out and there used, there's a little trailer in there. That's about where the roller coaster was. Now here's the best picture we have of the roller coaster. We were pretty excited to find this. There's the framing for the roller coaster. Now the roller coaster was built in 1911 and it created some excitement. We have one written account of somebody riding the roller coaster and they said it's exciting the first time. And then I guess it wasn't as exciting. The roller coaster kind of came to an end in 1913. There was a picnic there from a group from Newville and there was a young man, apparently alcohol was not a factor, who was showing off, and the way the trolley or the, the roller coaster worked, the, the car was on a track, but to keep it from going sideways, they had what was called a friction board, which is like a two by 10 board, and wheels rode against that. Well, this young man was showing off to some young ladies, and he fell and he got squished between the car and the friction board, and he died. Well, nobody really knew this guy, but they traced him to Philadelphia, and when they took the body back, He'd come to Newville about six years prior. They found that he'd left a wife and five children to come to Newville. So you might feel a little less pity for him now than at the beginning of the stuff, right? Um, but that was kind of the demise. They operated a roller coaster. And of course, there was an article in the next day's paper about every gruesome detail of this guy's death, written by an attorney who clearly, based on everybody they talked to, it was the young man's fault, not their fault, and they ran the trial or the roller coaster for the rest of the day, and people just kept riding. <laughs> Get him out of here. Um, but, <laughs> times have changed a little bit, you know. Um, but gives you an idea. Now, they later took some of their original open cars and enclosed them. It's been very difficult to find pictures. I'd like to have a picture of every trolley car, and we don't. Um, so I'm not sure if that's in fact a, a car from the Carlisle Mount High Railway, or in many cases they would borrow cars from the Cumberland Valley, the Valley Traction, so they, it might be otherwise. Um, very little documentation exists. So the park, there's one mystery structure shows up. Shows up in 1904, 1905, and then it's not there anymore. We don't know if it's a tent or what it was. There's brief mention of a roller or a merry-go-round in 1905. Maybe that's what it was. I would have thought if it was washed away by a flood or burned down, it would have showed up in the newspapers, but it, but it didn't. But this is an early shot, 1904, probably taken 1904, 03, of the park. And you can see how they planted trees along the creek after they made the renovations. This is the public dining area and the, the, the cooking area. And then the, the dam is, is down and the other buildings will be down on the left. But, to me, pretty interesting, the Lithia Springs and the Iron Springs. Lithia and Iron Springs were quite the rage then, but there wasn't any federal regulation. Now, if you have a Lithia Spring, it has to have Lithia in it. Um, but back then, it didn't. So here's a typical day of the park. And as I say, some days, they would get three to 5,000 people. And I think they were valid counts. 
and some of them would come by train. They put steps across the, the, the street at the railroad tracks, so you could come by train, and you, by this time you started to pay admission. Or you could come by train to Carlisle and then take the trolley. They had uh, political rallies. They had things like a predecessor or an agricultural event similar to the Granger's Picnic, uh, maybe a predecessor to that. And they would borrow trolleys, and they would just run trolleys after trolley after trolley till well into the night. And had to be quite successful. Now, depending on what year it was, if you look at that picture with all that people, they were either losing a great deal of money per passenger or they were making a little bit of money per passenger. But they never really made a lot of money. They never paid their bonds. And that's what eventually drove the whole works into bankruptcy. Is Remember Mr. Stewart from the Farmers Trust? Well, he invested in Cumberland Railways. He was the trustee for their bond sale. He had to sue them put them into bankruptcy. Now he had sold all his stock by that point. And the Mullins, I think, had sold all their stock. I think they had sold it to Mr. Kitzmiller and Mr. McCray. And again, if you come to the New Bill book uh, program, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Mr. McCray, but um, and, and Mr. Kitzmiller too. They're both pretty interesting. Um, they they put their own money into it, and then they would sell bonds for like the New Bill Electric Company. And instead of giving the money to the New Bill Electric Company, they'd say, "Well, that pays me back for the trolley." They got sued by the power company and they were found guilty and they had to pay back $50,000 to the, the power company. So all that finagling and, and intrigue is, is going around. Now the, the, the Mount Holly trolley was owned and operated by Cumberland Railways at that point in time. So they fell under that. They were able to pull that corporation out, put it into bankruptcy, then McDonald bought it and they restarted it. Now the, the sad thing to me is that we know that the Carlisle trolley operates in 1930. We don't have any photographs, known photographs of that operation. None whatsoever. And the Sentinel provided very little coverage of that trolley. There, when the, part of the problem was the trolley fares when they started were a nickel. And every time the trolley tried to raise the fare, the newspaper and the Chamber of Commerce in Carlisle would attack the trolley company for trying to raise the fare and they could never raise their fares. So starting in 1915, people started to operate jitneys or buses in competition with the trolleys. And the trolley fought them and they won for a while and then they lost and so they had bus competition and then the, the railroad company of course had their passenger trains and then the railroad company started a bus. So they had all this competition and every time they try and raise their rates because they hadn't paid their bond and they weren't making any money, everybody would fight them. Well, then they go bankrupt and they want to tear the trolley out. And who screams the loudest and don't take the trolley out? The Chamber of Commerce. Because they got the cheap labor that came by trolley from Mount Holly. They didn't want to lose that source of labor for the Carlisle businesses. So for a while in 1920, there's a joint effort between the Carlisle Chamber of Commerce and Mount Holly people to preserve the trolley line and do all they can, except don't raise the rates. And then McDonald gets involved in it and he operates it. But we can't find much about him. He operated the Carlisle foundry. And his brother-in-law was named Delone, and that's the Delone that the, the high school's named for in McSherry's town. So they were successful people, prominent people, but they, they got very little little coverage. Operated until 1930. The last trolley to operate um, was operated by the same guy, Lenhart, who operated the first trolley from Carlisle to Mount Holly. And that's the person in Mount Holly that Lenhart Street is named for. And it shut down and it was, was torn out, and that was kind of the end of the trolley in Mount Holly. So that's the the story, at least as I know it, of the, the trolley to Holly. Um, this is the inside of one of their cars. You know, the old copy of a copy of a copy kind of thing, projected not in, in great quality. One of their work cars, that was the early one that they bought, they built a second one later. But I think it'd be pretty neat if we could have a trolley from Carlisle to Mount Holly and be able to ride in that with the windows down on the day like today at 40 miles an hour. It'd just be pretty exciting. <laughs> Go out there in the band concert. Of course, they had ice cream at the park, and then it would get dark, and then the lights could come on. There was a trail went up to the top of the mountain. You can still find that, and they said you could see to Harrisburg. I've been there, and we've looked, and we don't see Harrisburg, but they said so. So, um, you know, by 1915, uh, Russ is dead. Pasco's dead. Most of the people are gone. Bossler's dead by that point. Graham's dead by that point. Kitzmillers are left in the craze, and then. The trolley just kind of fades away. There's a little bit more to the story, and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> Melissa Kitzmiller ends up owning all of Samuel's stuff. 
And according to family tradition, he died at a very opportune time. And in retrospect, we're glad he died when he did, because he dies in 1929 before the crash. So they settled his estate, they sold all the stock and everything before the stock market crashed. If he'd have waited a couple more months to die, they'd have lost a lot of money. I've heard that story. Now, Melissa ends up owning all this land that becomes the Holly Gap Game Preserve, and she becomes romantically involved with a guy by the name of Cumler from Steelwood, who she eventually sues for polygamy. <laughs> She, among three or four other people, were married to him <laughs> at the same time. So she starts this, and Cumler was involved, um, after the, the park starts, she starts what's called the Holly Gap Lake Preserve. And the intent was, was to make a big development. Now, just to help orient you a little bit, this is Route 94 coming in here. Here's the paper mill, and the parking area for the preserve would be back in here somewhere. So you can see the lake, and they were going to develop all this into houses and cottages and so on. The idea was good, I guess, thank God it didn't happen, but it goes bankrupt, and Melissa retains control of the land, ownership of the land. It eventually then gets sold to the group that now owns it, the, the Mount Holly Preserve, through some descendants, the Rillsburgers and the groups and some other local families in Mount Holly. And it be, becomes the Holly Gap Preserve. So it, we almost lost it. You know, we talk about saving mountain land, and imagine what it would have been like if they had put two or 300 cottages back in there now. Um, that might not have been so good. So that's how that turns out. Any questions or comments? Can you? Yeah. On that development, uh, mm -hmm. when, when was that in the 30s? Yes, it was in the... That's why he 30s... I'd have to look. Did By 34, it was over. Did, did they sell any of these lots? Uh, Two or three. It's not the people that are living in there now. To my knowledge, no, but that's why those people up there get a little touchy because the original right-of-way Apparently was up off Route 34, yeah. and the right of way now didn't exist, and there's no documentation of that right of way ever being deeded. <coughs> so that gets a little complicated. Another question in the back. Were they always electric trolleys, or yes, yes. So I've been told the ones that go through Mont or uh, through Church Town were horse drawn and then electric. No, they were electric right from the start. There were horse-drawn trolleys in Harrisburg prior to, but everything on the West Shore was electric. Every, everything in Cumberland County was electric. There were, to my knowledge, never any horse car operations anywhere in. There were stagecoaches, but not, not horse-drawn vehicles. Yes? How much would an individual trolley cost? The, the original cars that they got were in the range of $2,600, early 1900s. One cost ten dollars more than the other. I think the plush chairs must have cost an extra ten dollars. Now they were they were pretty big trolleys. They bought the two closed cars, number one and two. They bought new from Jackson and Sharp. Three and four they bought new. The rest they bought used from Philadelphia. And I have no idea where they came from or what the prices were. They would and the papers darn them weren't always good in their coverage. I mean the most important thing that happened in Carlisle that day was the arrival of the trolley, and they talk about a murder or something. You know, um, you can just I don't know where their priorities were. <laughs> yes? Uh, you talk about the brick, making the bricks in Mount Holly, they were identified in Mount Holly. Yes. They're getting harder to find. <laughs> yeah. To an old guy like me, who <laughs> talked to for about 50 years. Yeah, they were, and for those, the, 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 the Mount Holly brick and clay, am I allowed to do advertisements? If, if you're interested, <laughs> In the bookstore, we have a book on the, the brick, sand, and mineral industry, or, or brick, clay, and mineral industry in Mountain Creek Valley. And there's actually a second edition that we haven't gotten in the store yet. But after the iron industry stopped in the 1890s, they started to develop the clay. And for example, Tolan is named for Edward Tolan, who was the director of the Philadelphia Clay Company. And the, the houses of Tolan were built by the Philadelphia Clay Company. 
and named after Edward Tullin. And they built the Brickworks, which is off of Pine Street in Mount Holly. If you go over there now, there's a big feed mill, Ohio Blending, but that's where the Brickworks were. The bricks were what they called vitrified bricks, and then when they fired them, they got very hard. That was unfortunate because it was very hard for masons to use those bricks. But, and their color was unique. They were very attractive, and there's thousands of buildings that were built with them. There was a brick work in Pine Grove. The First Lutheran Church is Pine Grove brick, which is a thin, longer brick. So, and there was clay around here, too. There, and if you, um, I guess I touched on it a little bit in the, the, the trolley book, but more in the clay book, the second edition, with Kitzmiller and his battle with the clay company. He shut them down. He, he, uh, what a guy. Um, but yeah, the bricks are, are harder to find. They were part of a, in the early 1900s in America, from, it's hard to say exactly, but 1900 and 1907 were a time of, of robust development and investment. When you look at the, the money and the development that went into the country at that point in time, and infrastructure, it's just unbelievable. We, we could never do it today, even with public money, um, even if it wasn't plain money. And, you know, these trolleys and all were, were, were part of that process. Yeah. Good luck. Also, if you would uh, like to see or sit in a bench from Mount Holly, there's one upstairs. <laughs> oh, is there? Okay. There should be one up there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. still in this way? There's one, one from the park up there. Did Mrs. Kiss Miller own a lot of land in that area? Because one of her grandsons has a home in that area now. Yeah, she did. And all the, the, the preserve wall was Kitz Miller land. It went back okay. to the, the paper company. Now, the, the paper company, that's interesting. I'm working on a study of that. There was a little bit in the mill book, some of which is unfortunately incorrect. Um, but the, the paper companies developed, and they both at one time had common ownership, and they had huge land reserves. And then they sold the mills off, but the family retained the land that, that became the preserve. So, which is fortunate. Yeah, Matt? Well, <coughs> there was a gas station right beside the Deer Lodge. Yes. Was that the toll house, or was the toll house on the railroad track side of 34? The toll house was on the railroad side, okay. down about where the Snoopy tree is. Yeah. Those plots of ground, we always call it Diddy Wises. Right, right. right. Stupid, the spray and deer lodge was right in between. Right, and those plots of land were broken out, I want to say, in the Kirk in 1940. Bob Murray would have a better answer. It wasn't originally the deer lodge. It was something, I think it was something else, but, but they were broken out more recently, those, those two plots of land there, um, and then the, the paper mill uh, retained, the, the paper mill retained the area where the, the park was, and I'm, I'm not sure how it was divided out, but for some reason, the area where the Deer Lodge is, and up the hill, back the lane, up to and adjacent, it, it, some of that's owned by Ricker, and, and that went with the paper mill. Some of it, like Coons and, and Hoons, or those guys up there, those were broken out separately early, but then the rest stays with the preserve, so it's, it's pretty confusing. And some of that land up there was originally deeded to Andrew Jackson. When you look at the deed records, I mean, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and Terry and his staff have, have worked up all that. Um, now, Andrew was never here, but some way he got that land. And it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. But the, a lot of that, like the lake here and the lower dam, both were to generate water power for the mills. Um, and, and for the, the iron furnace, actually, that water came from further upstream. Um, there's a guy, Jim Robbins, knows a lot more about that than I do. But um, so those lakes were really the power sources, almost like the lake at Boiling Springs that, that powered the paper mills. So, um, but how it got divided up with time is, is kind of interesting. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Are there any uh, of the uh, trolleys in any of the trolley museums across the country, anywhere? No, not from these lines. Nothing. They were all destroyed that I know. Now, there, there is. One surviving Cumberland County trolley, the Valley Railways car number 12, is at Railways to Yesterday in Orbizonia, Rock Hill Furnace, Pennsylvania. They're starting a fund, if you're interested, to restore that. 
The interesting thing, that car was built by Jackson and Sharp, so it looks very similar to the Mount Holly cars. But it was, was separate, so um, they need a couple hundred thousand if you're interested. Uh, <laughs> Google railways to yesterday, and they'd be happy to take your money. Um, they will succeed um, and restore it to operating condition. They, they got trucks now. Something else that's interesting, a little bit problematic, when you go to restore something like that is that the trolley gauges in, in Pennsylvania, the tracks were built to a different gauge than the railroads. So the trolleys couldn't steal freight from the steam railroad companies. <laughs> So instead of four feet, eight and a half inches, it's like 58 inches or 60 inches. And most other trolley systems in the United States operate on railroad gauge. So when they go to restore a trolley, they have problems finding the trucks with the proper wheel spacing. But they were able to do that, so they'll be able to restore it. That was used as a, a cabin or a, a building up near Plainfield. And they also, at the same place, have a Harrisburg Railways car that became part of a house out next to the, the South Milton Township building. And they've been able to salvage both those and, and will restore both of those So, uh, with time. But unfortunately, no, none of these, these made it. And I'm sure when they shut down, what they typically did was they turned the car over, set it on fire, burned away everything but the metal, and then sold that. And Mr. McDonald probably used it in his foundry. Um, they, they tried to get whatever money they could, scrap the rail. By that time, of course, the, the highway was owned by PennDOT. Um, I don't know what happened. What's interesting, and I, I need to get the picture, but when they abandoned the trolley from Carlisle to Newville, the ballast was next to the road. When they rebuilt the highway, they used the ballast, but they actually put a narrow gauge railroad in to help move some of that. Of course, none of that survives, but um, any other questions, comments? It's, it's kind of, that's all I could find, and I've worked pretty extensively in the newspaper, the Hagley Museum, and anywhere else that I could, so. Yeah, Matt. Well, have, did you run into any of the, like, I'm pretty sure some of the sewer grates or the storm grates are old cut up to trolley track track in Mount Hollywood. Have you ever seen any of those? Because they're really unique looking. I, I have to go out and look. That's very possible. There are, I think, a couple of trolley poles, cast iron trolley poles that held the wire up at a house on the Pine Road in the backyard. Bob Murray's investigating that. Um, he's got on little benches. Um, but there aren't very many traces. That little bit of right-of-way that you can see, there might be a little bit of right-of-way visible south of Pine Road on the right hand or west side of the road, but virtually nothing survives. Like I say, the powerhouse burned down. Um, I've seen a few tickets and a, a few brochures. I bought a ticket that cost $185 at Mr. Ralph's auction. Um, so the stuff's kind of hard to find and it's, it's become a little bit pricey, but there's very little physical evidence that it survives. But I'll go check out the real interesting. Okay.